Hello and welcome. I'm Esther Allen, a professor at City University of New York, and I'm here with Allison Markin Powell, who translates Japanese literature and works with the Penn Translation Committee. She and I are co-organizers of Translating the Future, the conference you're now attending. Many of us have spent the past several months in social distance quarantine. Even so, many places face surging numbers of COVID-19 cases. It may seem as if only healthcare professionals are equipped to deal with this crisis, but those of us who work with languages may also be in a unique position to help. In a recent article in Wired Magazine, Gretchen McCullough called COVID-19 history's biggest translation challenge, calling attention to the lack of language support around the world and online for health resources. McCullough notes that many COVID translation projects are springing up all over the world. Adivasi Lives Matter has been making info sheets in languages of India, including Kodava, Marathi, and Odia. Seattle's King County has been producing fact sheets in languages spoken by local immigrant and refugee communities, such as Amharic, Khmer, and Marshallese. Viral Languages has been producing videos in languages of Cameroon, including Oshi, Agem, and Bafut, starring well-known community members as local influencers. Translators Without Borders and the Endangered Language Project are two additional groups that are providing these much needed resources to the public. Because our program has been reaching such a wide audience in so many countries and speaks so many languages, perhaps there are those among us who might be interested in working with one of these organizations. Translating the Future will continue in its current form throughout the summer and into the fall. During the conference's originally planned dates in late September, several larger scale events will happen. We'll be here every Tuesday until then with the week's hour long conversation. Please join us next Tuesday at 1.30 for Channeling Ghost Languages of Europe, featuring Martin Puchner and Peter Constantine and moderated by Tess Lewis. And remember to check the Center for the Humanities site for future events. Translating the Future is convened by PEN America's Translation Committee, which advocates on behalf of literary translators working to foster a wider understanding of their art and offering professional resources for translators, publishers, critics, bloggers, and others with an interest in international literature. The committee is currently co-chaired by Lynn miller Lockman and Larissa Kaiser. For more information, look for translation resources at pen.org. Today's conversation will be followed by a Q&A. Please email your questions for Boris Draluk, Eric Chimi, and Rajiv Mahabir to translatingthefuture2020 at gmail.com. We'll keep questions anonymous unless you note in your email that you would like us to read your name. And if you know anyone who was unable to join us for the live stream, a recording will be available afterward on the HowlRound and the Center for the Humanities sites. Before we turn it over to Boris, Eric, and Rajiv, we'd like to thank Bruna Dantas Lobato, whose panel at the 2019 American Literary Translators Association Conference served as inspiration for this mini series. We'd also like to offer our sincere gratitude to our partners at the Center for the Humanities at the Graduate Center CUNY, the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center, the Cullman Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library and PEN America, and also especially to the Masters of Dark Zoom Magic at HowlRound who make this live stream possible. And now over to you, Boris, Eric, and Rajiv. Thank you for that lovely introduction, Esther and Allison. Um, and thank you for uh, that very important announcement. Um, I very much hope that, that people take it up. Um, it's really a great pleasure to be here with, uh, with uh, two authors whose work I've uh, have become familiar with over the past month or so um, and have really kind of uh, plunged into. Um, and I think what we should do is begin with uh, a, a little profile of each of us. So we can offer our own linguistic background um, as, as the springboard for our conversation. Um, because I can only think in cliches and proverbs, it occurred to me that, you know, the premise of this panel is motherless tongues, but it does take someone to, to raise a tongue and uh, probably takes a village. So maybe we can start by talking about our, our entire linguistic villages, what makes up our, our individual tongues. And maybe we'll start with, with Rajiv. 
Yeah, thank you. This is uh, such a privilege and honor to be here. And I'm so grateful to be in conversation with you too, um, and to be asked to uh, contribute uh, to our conversation. Um, so yeah, and I like the way that you phrase that. What, what are our linguistic villages? You know, where have these languages come from? Um, I think that for me, like my, my migration history, um, my linguistic story is a little circuitous as well. Um, my home language was uh, or is English and Guyanese Creole. Um, and Guyanese Creole is the word that academics use to, to say what the language is, but are actually the way we say it is Creolese. Um, so my languages are English, Creolese, and a language called Hindustani. And Hindustani is a language that we call it from the inside. Outside people would say Caribbean Hindustani, Caribbean Hindi, uh, overseas Hindi, um, Guyanese Bhojpuri. And so these are the languages that I kind of come from. Um, my grandparents on both uh, my mother and father's side uh, were uh, last generation L1 speakers of uh, Caribbean Hindustani or Hindustani. Um, and they were also bilingual um, in Guyanese Creole or Creolese, as well as my mom's dad also capable in, in the English language. Um, and so um, my parents did not grow up speaking Hindustani or Hindi or anything like this, but we were so close to the cultural productions of the East Indian community in the Caribbean that, um, you know, the, the, the sonic hauntings and quality of these languages um, you know, filled our, our, very much filled our bodies. Thank you for that beautiful response. And I, I love this uh, a topic that you raised, the inside outside, what you yourselves call the language that you speak and what, what scholars have labeled it. I think that's a very crucial distinction, very interesting distinction. Maybe we'll get back to that. And maybe, maybe that's where Eric can begin. What, what language do you speak? <laughs> what, what, how would you describe your languages? Well, um... Well, I, I will uh, first thank you uh, for having me. I'm glad to have my two cents about uh, the ongoing discussion. Um, I specifically voice uh, my experience as a writer and as a traveler, because it is uh, as such as, as I first experienced my um, language or my language identity or my uh, who I am linguistically. Um, when I traveled to Canada in Quebec uh, more than 10 years ago as a student, uh, I was, uh, while uh, writing my resume, I was asked by a classmate why I didn't mention any African language. She, she asked me, do you speak African? <laughs> <laughs> so this was uh, uh, the first time I answered such a question with joy. Uh, but um, uh, while uh, going uh, up in Africa, it is not. It was not common to mention my uh, origin or my uh, mother tongue or native tongue, or as we put it, uh, 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 national tongue, because it is uh, always um, uh, intertwined. Uh, it's, it's always related to um, uh, identity and ethnicity. And to avoid that, uh, we just talk about official, lang official language, French and English. So I was, uh, have, I've always um, uh, talked about myself as a French native speaker, <laughs> which I'm not because uh, uh, my native tongues are Cameroonian. And um, in addition to French and uh, these Bantu languages, I have a degree in uh, classical languages, Latin. I studied Latin for seven years, but it's also something I cannot uh, mention because uh, it is um, just, uh, the, it's like a scholar language, dead language is not of uh, a daily use in my life. So, um, but this background, multicultural background, um, uh, helped me uh, today uh, define and uh, finally uh, choose to, uh, to talk about Camp Franglais. Yeah. Camp Franglais, which is a pidgin 
uh, French pidgin in Cameroonian. And uh, because it is the identity, uh, identity linguistic that defines me the best. So uh, I will talk about Fancam Franglais today. Well, that's, that's really fascinating. Um, one thing that both of you, I think, raised is the encounter with uh, another speaker, another metropole that makes you reflect on what it is that you, you actually speak, what, what, it is, what it is that makes up your own linguistic profile. I think the same goes for me to a lesser degree. I, 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 my my um, linguistic background is not as complicated. Um, I was born in a, a city in what is now Ukraine that at, at one point belonged to the Soviet Union. Kiev. And before then, no, close, very close, uh, Odessa, okay. <laughs> uh, but very close. Um, so uh, I, was, I was born in Odessa, uh, which was for uh, a long time, uh, predominantly, or at least lar uh, in, in large part, a Jewish city. Uh, but in a city in Ukraine, the primary language of which was Russian. And that created a stew of, uh, of uh, interpolations. So uh, there was a, a lot of Yiddish inflection in the Russian spoken in Odessa, quite a bit of Ukrainian uh, in terms of lexical items. Um, grammatically, it was still more or less Russian, but Russian with a lot of uh, peculiarities. Uh, but of course, I didn't realize that I was speaking a peculiar Russian as a child until I emigrated to the United States where the, uh, it, when I was eight years old. The pressure then was to learn English, but I was also part of a wave of Russian speaking uh, emigres and the people around me, these Russian speaking children, uh, pointed to the fact that I have an accent, that I uh, uh, misspoke, that I uh, used the wrong words um, for basic items like a, you know, a, a bag of, at, a, at a supermarket. Um, and it was only then that I came to realize that, that even my Russian is peculiar. Not only am I peculiar as an immigrant to the United States, but also my Russian isn't really fully Russian. And um, uh, searching for a way to communicate the peculiarity of that of that language, uh, which has its own literary tradition, has its own spoken tradition, to communicate that peculiarity in a recognizable way in English is is one of the great pleasures of my life. Um, and Rajiv, how 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 about you? How do you communicate this mix of of uh, influences in poetry that is ostensibly English? <laughs> <laughs> very, very clumsily. <laughs> I, um, I do a lot of surgery with blunt instruments. Um, and so I think the way that I do it is I imagine my speaker in whatever poem um, it is, uh, actually stands at the crossroads of these kind of historic traditions and is constantly on the, the change or on the riding the wave of evolution linguistically and you know, when it comes to identity as well, because, you know, like Eric has said, like, so much of our identities in the Caribbean are, uh, or, you know, in the world are, um, you know, defined by the languages that we speak and that we know and the languages that we come from, whether they're heritage languages that we no longer speak as, um, you know, second, third, fourth, fifth generation Indians, let's say, in the Caribbean. Um, and so for me, it's just a matter of where I see my speaker. I mean, I don't think my speakers are ever not brown, if that makes sense. Like they're never unmarked. And, um, and I think that like the act of, you know, whether or not I intentionally mark them, this is more a subconscious or a connection with my subconscious way of thinking through language or whatever problematic it is that I'm trying to like diffuse or, um, you know, loosen through a poem. Um, poems have that elasticity. Oh yes, I'm thankful for that. And maybe uh, this would be a good time to perhaps offer uh, a bit of your poetry, just so that we have a concrete example of what of what you're communicating. Yeah, sure. Um, so um, I know that Esther wanted me to read from the translations that I did. I even regret night. So maybe I'll do that in just a bit because, like, more more um, pertinent to our conversation is this. Um, so. Um, C.D. Wright in um, uh, An American Cooling Time, An American Poetry Vigil, talks about the, the work that a form can do for inv invigorating the history of a poem. And so I was thinking about this <clears throat> book specifically when I gave myself this kind of um, parameters for writing these poems that I'm about to read to you, or a poem that I'm going to read to you. Um, and 
through it, uh, I was thinking, what is the language or what is the poetic form that is like native to my community? Um, and yes, there is the English language poetry that is, you know, from it, it was the 1930s that people in my community started to write in, in English and to publish under the the umbrella of, um, you know, the colonial hegemonic um, powers at play. And these were the British folks who had sugarcane colonies all over the world. Um, and from that, a very syncretic kind of musical tradition was born that mixed, um, you know, beats that were uh, descended of Africa, um, uh, as well as Hindustani or Indian um, lyrics and thinking. And so this kind of music in the 60s was uh, burgeoning at the time of the decolonization movements that were happening in the Caribbean. And so for me, this type of song, and they're called chutney songs, represent this kind of the, the, both uh, the nexus as well as the kind of like free liberation. And so mm -hmm. since these traditions are mostly oral, I was like, okay, I'm going to be doing a violence by putting them down onto paper. And, you know, so this is a violent attempt, but I think that I want to kind of shake up that idea um, of stasis and to think continually about what it means to be in movement. Um, and so this is called, uh, the first poem that I'll read for you is called The Poco Kid, as in the post-colonial kid. Um, and so the thing about the Chutney poem is that it starts with, um, a chorus that's in Hindustani, in the Hindustani that my grandmother spoke. Um, and then at the very end, I translate it for you. It's written in 14 lines to mimic the, the structure of that colonial education that we came through of the sonnet, as well as including uh, words and phrases in English, um, as well as um, uh, Creolese. So this is kind of uh, the, the, what the creation is speaking from. The Poco Kid. Matahit Logan Borna Sakila, Darasan Nihi Murjake Murad. Let's get one thing queer. I'm no Sabu like sidekick. I'm the main drag. Ram Ram in a sari, Salam on the street. I don't speak Hindu, Khaki, or Indian. Can't control minds. Have no psychic powers. I clip my yellow nails at dusk. On Saturday nights, I shave my head. Forgive me, Shiva. Forgive me, Saturn. I'm Cooley on Liberty Ave, Desi in Jackson Heights, where lights spell season's greetings to cover Christmas, Diwali, and Eid, where white folks in ethnic aisles ask, will your parents arrange your bride? while Ma and I scope out fags, gyaf and laugh while aunties thread our eyebrows. The subaltern cannot speak. Representation has not withered away. So that last couplet um, is the translation, like I said, of the original um, verse. And that I've taken from Gayatri Svivak's essay um, and translated it into this Hindustani language that is not even written down sensibly. Um, and so I, I, I'm going to read another one to this, just so there's more of a, a kind of crossroads of language and sound, if that's okay, if you both will humor me. Absolutely, absolutely. I already have several questions, but yes, please. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> this poem is called Kuli. And so Kuli, you know, is, well, maybe you don't know, is a derogatory name that's been ethnicized in the Caribbean to represent people of South Asian descent. But it's also, it also describes a kind of... Uh, uh, labor um, that replaced slavery after it was the transatlantic slavery, a uh, slave trade was abolished by the British in um, 1934. You know, the, the, the crown turned its greedy eye to its, the jewel of its crown, which was India, um, so to speak. And look, quite literally, the jewels of the British crown came from India. So um, this talks a little bit about that. Uh, things you need to know, Kuaja means my dad's dad. Mm -hmm. Kuli nam dharaya, jay hamke tej pakadai, jay sanchuri kate hamke gayanava me ake. With this whip scar, iron shackle name, aja, contract bung, whole day cut came. Come night, he drink up rum fiso until he wind up and pitch in a trench black water and cry, oh, manager. 
until sugar and pressure claim he too was. The background manager laughed away. So come, so done. I was born a crab dog devotee of the silent god, the jungle god, the crosser of seas. White tongues licked the sweet demerara of my sores. Now, stateside, Americans erase my indenture story. Call me Indian. Can't they hear Kalapani in my voice, my breath's marine layer when I say? They made us hold the name Kuli, like a cutlass. It bit us coming to Guyana. Brilliant. Wow. Yes, powerful. It, 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 it reminds me of a um, uh, uh, French port uh, from um, a port from uh, French overseas, from Guadeloupe, uh, whose name is um, uh, Guy Tyrolien, uh, because of the tone the it sounds like a prayer and it deals with a lot of um concepts we are interested in when we talk about um uh, language i mean uh metropolis and uh, what i don't know if uh, uh, boris used this word purposefully when he says pressure because when you use the word pressure i was wondering i, I was thinking of um, a previous discussion about betrayal and I would add uh, from my own experience, the feeling of guilt sometimes. Mm -hmm. And it changed over the times. Uh, a few years ago, a few decades ago, th this guilt was uh, because of, uh, it was like a shame of speaking her own language. But at some point it, it changed, uh, it, it, it has become um, uh, a desire of, um, of uh, assume her multi, multilingual background. I'm both French, but I'm also come from Anglais. And that's why uh, the, 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 what I want to share with you today is um, uh, a song. Because mm -hmm. come from Anglais uh, doesn't, it exists, it is used, widely used in our literature. But as, um, uh, a way of decorating, of improving, of uh, making the French literature more uh, um, uh, exotic, more um, vigorous. But um, uh, from my standpoint, it's not Camphanglais, just a dialect. It's used in the advertisement, in the in the in medias, and more and more in social medias where we have people who are followed by um, thousands of people by writing uh, series and short stories. So while we, do, we did think that it's uh, in Cameroon, in some uh, countries in Africa, people were not um, uh, very uh, into reading, into the, uh, we, uh, we, I've come to think that it really depends on what you give to people. If you uh, succeed in um, touching, in, in addressing the issues, if they uh, can identify to your discourse, they will love your heart. So uh, this song, I have just, just last three minutes, three short minutes, it's written, written in uh, Camp Anglais, but uh, I will share like the, 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 the caption in uh, Camp Anglais. We recognize English word as will the French native speaker, French word, but it won't make sense neither for you nor for the, the French uh, speaker. It's why I think that it's not a French slang, it's a, um, a, a language, uh, a full blown language. Okay, so uh, if I, okay, uh, I will share my screen, just two minutes. Technical, okay. Oh, it was disabled. Oh, <laughs> I think, okay. I thought oh, so it, it works. It works. Okay. Okay. <laughs> 
Well, Mais You know pas c'est seulement six mois. Eh. Mais gars, il y a les deux où tu te lèves le sable, tu begin à Wanda que rien dans ta life ne va quand. Euh oh même le pays frère qui au quoi te côté le café begin à te call Wanda. Begin à science sur all les faux et que tu as pu tout. Tu Wanda que tu veux dormir du way mais gars. <rire> Il n'y a pas les deux, assez, c'est encore qu'elle rire qu'on te brasse pour n'importe quoi. Bindi want to blow, pourquoi les gars y'a mon peu balade comme ça Assez, la vie si c'est même quoi non Moi et Wanda mon frère, ça c'est même quoi Les gars ont le sang à l'œil, tu t'amuses on se blesse, pour une histoire de las, tu ne veux pas tu laisses. Hey, assez, donc la vie si c'est ça, ha, je ne sais pas prêt mon frère, ça c'est même quoi C'est le dem, c'est le dem, c'est le dem. En fait, le dem, c'est quand tu deviens la jomba de ton dieu. La foi est libre. Pourquoi les gars vexent quand tu es un mot ton dieu C'est ta personne même qui te chiba, ta pays qui te sissia. Et puis que tu cours dans le sac là, à quoi dit dans mon ça on dit que le vol n'est pas mou, que nos son doit se faire là. Mais quand les wins ne voient qu'à part, quand on n'a plus de pola, le système est à cap, les grands frères. Well, um, I'll stop sharing because uh, the most important part was uh, actually the, 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 the lyrics. I want uh, us to read together this lyrics to uh, make you to, to um, uh, see how the, the, the because it's, It can, it's the rough, uh, the equivalent of um, flash fiction or and, um, spoken word. Mm -hmm. Spoken word, not spoken word po poetry, because it can be poetry, but also short stories. And in this case, it is a short story. And um, she called it slam, because it uh, can be a synonym of, 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 uh, of, uh, of uh, spoken word. But uh, by, uh, if you have the opportunity to listen, to, 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 to uh, read the lyrics, you'll see that this uh, whole text can be translated into French and into English without having to just borrow as we do when we write, for example, when we, we, we write, when we write novels, because we are uh, aiming, we are, our goal is to reach a specific uh, audience readership. We have to uh, change a lot of things. We have to make our writing more uh, uh, polished, more uh, accept acceptable, which is not the case when we uh, listen uh, to uh, the music because it is the, it's a site of empowerment. When we sing in Africa, we don't, try to mimic what American or French do. But when we write, when we do write, when we do translate, we want uh, to, uh, to uh, speak, to write as French people do. It's mm -hmm. why for uh, a linguistic approach of the cultural fact in Cameroon, you have to um, uh, adopt a kind of uh, an inter intercultural awareness, which consists of Uh, immersed into our music, and this is precisely what I, I'm doing in my uh, teachings and also in my translation. I don't try. I don't uh, try when translating to um, to uh, 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 put a glossary at the end or to uh, use the um, the to, to, to just to borrow the words that. Uh, I did not that that doesn't that that doesn't exist in the uh, target language, but I try to find words because I I think that it's a different language, and by trying to just picking us up words, uh, we don't enrich the Tampanglais. We don't we just uh, serve the French, the English, and the uh, main languages. 
Thank you. So, uh, uh, yeah, I would love I would love to take a look at the at the lyrics. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, I, I, I don't. I can share the, the lyrics right now. I want if you can. Uh, we've been quick. Yes. If okay, that's it. I think it's okay. Ah. Okay, can you read it? Yes. Oh. For, for example, <laughs> mens. Okay, mens is a French word. Is an interjection, but in this case. It is not, it's like, it has a static function. Like, uh, uh, for example, when you tell a fairy tale, there is like um, a formula be beginning, uh, once upon a time, once. So men's aims I drawing the attention of the listener. If you try just to consider it as a borrowing of the French, you won't get, yeah. won't understand the whole thing. So, je ne know pas, for example, si seulement chez moi, hein? So, you can't uh, recognize English word in every, uh, in uh, um, the, the lyrics, in the, any lines, any verse, but they, uh, uh, it's not just about vocabulary. Huh? For example, when the, we, we say life ne waka pa, waka, it's, uh, there was a, a compound word, this, they come from uh, loan words, waka, work, functions, and also wanda, wonder, but it has a different meaning and a different um, uh, value. And uh, they, this word tell a different stories from what you have been used to, to what about them. So it's, uh, it's why I, I, I it's, it's beautiful written, it's beautiful written, but if you, for example, I watch such a story and it will be considered as to be rotten or broken French, as we say, rotten or broken English. But it is not. Once again, it's beautifully written. It is um, the tone, the rhythm is just about, you know, a, once you, you, you know, uh, you understand uh, the, 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 this language, the, it's, 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 it sounds uh, much more uh, beautiful as um, uh, than when you consider it to be just a, a dialect, a French dialect or anything. So this is the, 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 the lyrics. For example, when she says, les gars ont le sang à l'oeil. Hmm? Les gars ont le sang à l'oeil. In French, it doesn't make sense. Hmm? And also, I want to just, sorry, we don't have a lot of time, but uh, it's not just spoken, used by uh, Cameroonian. There's a great writer so whose name is uh, Nicolas Farc. I love you, love you. And um, four years ago, he wrote La Trappe, uh, Attache ton coeur, the title of his novel, Attache ton coeur. When I first read the, the titles, it reminds me of uh, Salinger, eh? the, uh, the, 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 the Catcher of the Rye. The, the, the French translation is uh, La Trappe coeur. But I knew that it was. Uh, Camfangle phrase. And uh, at some point, I read a review of the novel and by a French uh, scholar. You can find it on by Googling just uh, uh, Apela Daniel and the title of the novel. And he was, uh, he, he, he found the novel to be uh, great and uh, awesome. It has a lot of superlatives, but at the end, he points out that the title doesn't uh, serve the, uh, because it was enigmatic. It was his work, mm. but it was not for someone who uh, knew how, because attach ton coeur is just a way of saying that, uh, be prepared to what I will be telling to you. Uh, mm. It's the performative way, in the same way as in, in, this, in, the, in the beginning of this song, the opening line is mains, attach ton coeur, be prepared, be prepared, I'm about to talk about something. So the thing is, uh, French has to be, the, the, the French language, more inclusive of all these var varieties of French. When you open the world document, for example, you have uh, France, uh, Francais de France, Français 
de Belgique, Belgium, français de Québec. But you don't have anything about French, uh, français d'Afrique. Mm? Mm -hmm. And in Africa, you have uh, not only uh, Creole, but also, for example, in Ivory Coast, Nushi. Mm -hmm. It's also, you do like uh, 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 which is a different language. And by including uh, more French word in the uh, dictionary, in the, they would make easier for the for the readers, for the readers, for the, the, the audience to understand the way people practice French in Africa, for example. So I know. I, I, I really like what you're saying about this kind of um, the, these languages that exist having their own kind of um, uh, full blownness or um, their own kind of uh, semantic um, integrities that are different from French. Um, you know, in the Caribbean, there's like a deep and long intellectual transition. Uh, uh, tradition of thinking about nation language as you know these Englishes mm -hmm. that are spoken that are you know non-normative to the, the the empire let's say um, and I think that like what you're articulating is really interesting too because like I like what I see as like a, a, a through line um, is a state of um, interness or you know a blending kind of space or like a, mm -hmm. an ecotone or um, a contact zone and like, I really appreciate you sharing that song as well. And like yeah. jumping on, like continuing this thought of like internet, I know that you Boris, I know that you write, um, you know, in nonfiction mode as well as poetry and translation. And I'm just wondering like how in your experience does that um, come together for you? I, I really appreciate that, that question. And I, I think it actually gets, gets back to a question of mine that, that I've been waiting to ask from the beginning that has just kind of snowballed in my mind, mm -hmm. which is uh, and something that Eric brought up and, and that you too hinted at, um, the role of poetry and translation in creating a recognition for uh, languages that are dismissed as dialects or corruptions or idiolects, um, and basically training the audience uh, to appreciate um, through pleasure, uh, uh, often through great uh, emotional rewards, a certain language uh, for which they, they simply didn't have the appreciation before. And uh, you know, I, I do write nonfiction. I feel nonfiction is a is um, uh, a tool of uh, it, in the same toolkit. It, it what it does is it, it creates a kind of uh, entry point um, uh, for uh, for people into a tradition that they may at first shrink from because it seems too unfamiliar but if you if you do it right if you if you set something up correctly either through uh, as, as you do by using a 14 line form that is immediately recognizable to the eye and kind of welcomes the reader to the page or through a nonfiction uh, introduction or through a pop song uh, in class in a classroom you're welcoming people into a tradition that they can then breathe freely in um, so all of these things in my mind are, are intertwined. Uh, all, all of the, the, the uh, very minor roles I play, both as a, as a reviewer and as a, you know, a blogger, which is the most motherless form of writing, uh, yeah. and, and as a, as a yeah. poet uh, and as a translator, all of these things blend together. They're, a, 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 I think, are meant to welcome people into a, um, to a small, peculiar world that is actually much bigger than they, they think. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, I do. I, it, it does because, like, the way I think about this is like, well, when when I sit around and tell stories with my family, it's not just in one genre. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. A lot of it is fiction. Let me tell you, a lot is exactly, and then song and poems. Like, it all exists in that same kind of space. And I wonder if that's what it means to kind of like stand at the nexus of all of these different kind of linguistic traditions and heritages and etc. In in my case. Um, Again, it's 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 slightly different. So because of, I see the the the, uh, the uh, primary contribution I could make as a translator is uh, creating a uh, a flexible uh, and welcoming English form for a literature that I value, but that even in the original metropolitan system is kind of secondary or tertiary. This kind of Odessa criminal ballads, let's say. Uh, in translating these uh, into English, um, I, I do mostly post them to my blog because what journal would ever accept such a thing. <laughs> but uh, what, what I do is I create a, a narrative of, around them that's uh, as, as warm and as welcoming and as informative as I can make it, but without introducing too much, too much context, just enough. And then I find an English that already exists, that, that has its own tradition and try to meld these two traditions 
of partly through linguistic links and pi partly through genetic links. You know, a lot of these um, songs that that were composed, uh, kind of folk compositions or authored compositions in Odessa in the uh, in the nineteen twenties about uh, the underworld there. Well, you know, similar songs and similar stories were being composed in the Lower East Side in New York in the 1920s around the same time by largely the same population who had just immigrated to a different country. And, uh, and so uh, because there is already a tradition of that in English, I have a, a nice cozy mattress on which to plop and uh, a nice pool of resources from which to draw in order to, to give, uh, give these things life in English. So. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's but, but you're absolutely right, this mix of genres, this half lie, half truth, um, th these are the compromises that, that we make when we speak, much less uh, when we sit down to translate. This yeah. sounds beautiful. Can you give us an example from your own writing? Yeah, the, oh. it's, it's, it's the mix of, lang of, uh, of language also, because uh, yeah. I've noticed that you uh, use French, at least as a bibliographic in a lot of oh. your work. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> you are, well, you're, Francophile. I don't like this word because it's like fetishism. But um, I was wondering the. I'm a Franco fake. <laughs> yes, Franco <laughs> fake. <laughs> yes. Do you, it, uh, it has a, a, a particular function, or it it just comes as like it's your background, and when you 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 what you do what it just uh, comes more. Is it uh, purposefully, or is there just something that you cannot prevent or friend yourself to do? when you uh, write poem, for example, I think of Miss Hollywood, for example, that uh, you just yeah. read. Uh, I, I, really, uh, I really appreciate th that question too. Uh, I, I think that in, in the case of poetry, I don't write very much of it, but when, when I do write it, it, it is like Rajiv, I try to communicate through form, uh, you quoted right so effectively, I try to communicate through form a different background, even when the form seems completely identical to a form that already exists in English. So in my case, I, I'm, I'm really drawn to what is called the Onegin stanza, which is a 14 line form. It yeah. looks like a sonnet when you first glance yeah. at it, but, but it's rooted in the Russian tradition, in the Russian literary tradition. Uh, and it's unmistakable when you, when you take a closer look, you know exactly where, where it comes from. Uh, and so the challenge of, of creating something that, that from far away looks like a sonnet, but from close up is unmistakably Russian is something I really appreciate uh, uh, and, and uh, really thrive. <laughs> in that in that stricture, but I'll I'll um, I'll uh, share the, a kind of a typical uh, silly blog post and and show you what I do. So uh, let's share this one. Uh, actually, let me. Yeah, this is a good one. S no, it, let, let's let's go all out. I'm gonna issue a trigger warning. Okay, this is there, there's literally a gun in here and all kinds of other bad things. Uh, but uh, it's a song that um, first let's let's hear the Russian performed by, with a little nice clip, performed by uh, one, of, uh, one of the Soviet Union's brightest stars, Vladimir Vysotsky, and also darkest stars. It's quick. Okay, so that's enough. Just a little taste. I can I can play the whole thing for you, but uh, mm. uh, and I would glad, gladly do that. But we're running out of time. So the first thing that any Russian speaker notices about this performance is, first of all, it's acoustic and it's intimate, uh, and it's kind of uh, uh, conspiratorial in its tone. Uh, but it's also full of uh, Yiddishisms. For instance, he uses the word "gelt" instead of "money." So automatically, uh, the performer is larding the the text with indications that it comes from a different tradition or that it's a mix of traditions. It's not your pure standard Russian romance. It has a Jewish element. It's an underworld song. Um, and uh, uh, the, the Yiddishness of it, as well as the pronunciation where certain vowels are, are made softer or, or uh, a, a little less, uh, a little less uh, pointy, uh, also indicates that it's from Odessa because Odessa has this mix of Ukrainian and Yiddish sounds to its vowels that, um, that no other Russian speaking place has. So what I try to do is, uh, you know, because I'm an inveterate reader of hard boiled detective novels and, and uh, all of this stuff, I, I recognize the tradition in the Russian and I find a tradition, analogous tradition in, in the English. So you know, uh, 
the way I translated it is, we went to pull a job, me and Rabinovich, but Rabinovich had to knock one back. After all, why shouldn't a poor Jew wet his whistle if he ain't as busy as all that? So as to get a stiff one and a bit at Simis, we ducked into a rundown little joint. There we saw her, Surka, and she had a pistol underneath her skirt, loaded with shot. Now, that immediately is, uh, I, I think, uh, for anyone who reads hard-boiled detective novels, uh, brings all of that uh, to the fore, all of that language, all of that intonation, those uh, grammatical quirks. Um, but it also, you know, throws in the Jewish element. So I couldn't get Geld to work in the context, but I have Simis here. So that those those are the compromises that that uh, yeah thrill me. <laughs> so I'll stop sharing now because well I'm I'm embarrassed to to issue yet more trigger warnings. Okay, when I was uh, reading this piece, I, I uh, thought of I think of uh, I thought of um, Vygotsky oh, because I've never heard of uh, Vygotsky, and I was yeah. wondering if you are familiar with Vygotsky too because. Uh, He's oh yes, really. When it comes to linguistic, and it's someone I was, uh, um, uh, I, I, especially the dialogical theory, I work a lot with uh, with uh, his uh, Vygotsky and yes. the it. and uh, it has nothing to do for sure. But I just, I just wanted <laughs> oh, no. to notice that. Vygotsky. But there is, there is uh, the underworld knows no knows no barriers and boundaries. That kind of language knows no barriers and boundaries and travels very freely, just as the people who perpetrate crimes travel very freely. <laughs> so you have, you, have the same, you have the same tradition in, uh, of course, the United States, but then it you know, made its way very easily through, through uh, the Serie Noir into, into, Fran into France and, mm -hmm. and from there spread around the, the Francophone world. Okay. But okay, we're getting very criminal and I, I know it's time to stop. <laughs> 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 um, listening to all three of you, I keep thinking about this idea of a linguistic elsewhere that you're all haunted by, um, and in, in all these different ways. For Boris, it's the linguistic elsewhere of Odessa, which probably no longer in exists even linguistically in the surprised. way that you're describing it. Oh, it still does. <laughs> okay. Well, as of, for, last, as of last year, there were still echoes of it. Oh, okay, of but year. echoes of it, right? So yeah. it too is being linguistically transformed. And for you, there's this sequence, Rajiv, of linguistic elsewheres that go all the way back to the Indian subcontinent, but then come via the Caribbean. Whereas with your work, Eric, the, it, it's like you're inhabited by these, these Francophone and Anglophone elsewheres that have that have colonized you as opposed to, it's like the immigrant experience versus the colonial experience, right? Um, th there are different layers there. Um, so all of that is leading to a question, which I think is for Eric, which is about the impact. You've chosen a pop culture example. Um, to what degree is this pop culture that you're, that this confranglais pop culture mm -hmm. influenced by say the pop culture of the United States? Is the pop culture of the United States present there? Is it impactful? Yeah. Is there is there a strong connection there? Yes, there is. Obviously, since it's uh, when we talk about hip hop, there's a lot of uh, American influences. But um, I do prefer uh, refer to the African influence uh, ingrained in this. Uh, uh, song in this uh, in this music because it is quite obvious that when, uh, for example, what I talk, what I call the spoken word uh, uh, short stories, the spoken word poetry is uh, the, she tries to uh, mimic what happened in the Western world, but she goes beyond that, beyond the colonial paradigm because. Um, uh, uh, in the lyrics, uh, as, 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 as I put it, you, you will uh, notice a lot of um, poetic phrases drawn from our linguistic background. So, and uh, uh, for example, right now there is a crisis in Cameroon between anglophone and francophone speaker because the use of these languages are so, uh, it's it, these, these languages have become nationalist, national languages. They are not. They are, they are no longer just uh, administrative or official. Is the reason why the French-speaking uh, uh, Cameroonian, uh, the, the English speaker, feel, feel feels uh, dominated by the French 
speaking part of Cameroon. And uh, we have this uh, sense that our uh, country uh, falls into tribe uh, while they don't uh, value our um, uh, own linguistic background. So this is contradictory, it's paradoxically, paradoxical, but <laughs> that's what it's, it is actually in this moment. Um, I mean, I have a question. I'm going to see if I can articulate it myself. I think, I think it's sort of for Boris and Rajiv, but just but because you, I know that you work more actively as translators. But since you're talking about the way that you're working in, you're utilizing all of these other the other languages that you have access to in your original work, but then when you're working. It, on translations, when you're working as a translator, do you feel the need to sort of choose one or sort of, it, it sort of narrows your, does that happen or is that, or are you able, still able to, to sort of pull from these other threads? It's a brilliant question. So I'll let Rajiv answer it. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh. Well, you know, so yeah, when it came to translating, I even regret night, Holy Songs of Demerara, um, which was a text written in 1916 by, and the only firsthand um, account of indentured labor uh, in the Anglophone Caribbean. Um, you know, I, I, as I was thinking through this, I had come up with this problematic that actually when these songs are translated in the community, they're not translated into just a safe, sanitized English. Rather, they are translated into Creolese first, and then the migration to English may happen or it may not. The idea then is like, what is the gist? And so for me as like a translator, I confronted this uh, kind of story or the, the, the this truth um, as I was giving a reading of my translations and people were like, well, could you translate it into Creolese? And so on stage, I'm there with the book in my hand and um, I just, okay, yeah, let me try it. And then I did, and then it just, it opened up a whole new world of understanding this. And so the press was really taken by this as well. And they were like, have a section of the book where you've also translated it into Creolese. Mm. And so, you know, thinking about um, the, uh, translation as just a, a migration from one place to another, I think is, is no longer a reality. Um, and so I want so much for this text to also be kind of instructive for the next generation of people who mm. want to speak this language. And so part of like the charge of it all is like, it's a bilingual, trilingual thing. Um, I can't wait for the next generation um, of Caribbean poets to translate this book in their own idiom. So I don't, I don't think I really answered your question, but it was a funny situation that kind of arose. And now your turn, Boris, your right. turn to answer the question. No, I think, I think that, uh, that uh, Rajiv, you get, you get at something that also affects me and, uh, or a consideration that I always also make is uh, what is the intent of the original? If the original is written in, in a type of Russian uh, that wasn't meant to conform to the standard rules, in fact, was meant to be a breath of fresh air. It was meant to expose people to something new. Um, why would I translate it into an English that, that is meant to fit a very easy paradigm. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that just doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, and especially when it comes to, you know, the work of uh, someone like Isaac, Isaac Babel, uh, who's a, a hometown hero of mine from Odessa. When, when he appeared on the scene in the 19 teens and 20s, the, the striking thing about him was precisely his mastery, both of standard Russian, that was clear, that was beyond doubt, but his, his uh, incredibly fine ear for a different kind of storytelling and a different kind of language. The, the language of Odessa's streets. And so uh, when, when translating something like that into English to, to make it sound uh, like any old translation of Chekhov or Tolstoy or Dostoevsky um, or just doesn't do the trick. So uh, uh, it, it's, it's important to find a, a language that is a, a bracing uh, uh, and uh, I hope to have found it. Although of course I am picking from the tradition but so was Bobby, he was also picking from the tradition just recombining it in new and interesting ways. A follow-up question for all three of you, um, which is that uh, you're you're all three describing this beautiful multilingual utopia where everyone accepts infinite forms and varieties and combinations and multiplicities, and yet something tells me that that might not exactly be the world that we are living in. Um, and I'm just wondering if it, if you'd like to comment on any kinds of pushback that you've gotten 
uh, you know, the, oh no, that's not right. Oh no, Camp Franglais is not a language. Oh no, you can't have all these combinations. Um, the, the language police, um, you know, encounters with language police. I think Eric would probably have yes, the, many, many. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the, I start by saying that uh, now uh, I consider Camp Franglais is a site of desecration of the French, the, of the colonial languages. So uh, it's, uh, um, we, we uh, do use this language, it's spoken in rebuttal, right? to, to make uh, French an, um, an obituary, it's an obituary of French as uh, we knew it. Uh, so uh, we, uh, we uh, kinda, kind of claim our own use, our distortion of the language and our reinvention of a different, a new, language. So it is, and uh, just as you said, there, there are many uh, trends, many uh, tendencies, and there are the, the establishment, the, the major press in France keep, uh, are very conservative about the use of French. And uh, unlike, for example, uh, with uh, like, with, uh, unlike the, the Portuguese, for example, uh, the French, there is a, a geographical uh, notion standard. When you, when you talk, when you think of French, you think of Paris. You think of Paris. Sure, there is a Quebec or Switzerland, but we uh, the metropole uh, remains Paris. And uh, I think that my generation, we, we are trying to explode this uh, concept, conception of of language of French as a colonial uh, legacy. But we, uh, it's, we, we, it's, we have uh, appropriate, we uh, uh, consider is it to be our own language uh, now, as of now. Rajiv? Uh, yeah, so um, even the thinking of these languages like Creolese and Hindustani in my family, uh, how we have really drank, we really have like taken deep the, the kind of monikers that were bestowed upon us as these are broken languages. You know, we speak broken Hindi, we speak broken English. We are essentially broken from the fracture of colonization. But, you know, um, it's true. Like people will read something in Creolese and be like, uh, why is this being published? But it's such, a, um, um, it's such a, an act of resistance, I think. Um, and I've been lucky in kind of like my publishing history to, to kind of like find a place and have folks who are, you know, who believe in this kind of work. But it's a very rare time that I am performing or reading in a place where people can latch on to everything. And I think that's beautiful because like, I think that like opening up the world, you know, in this way is one way of dreaming this utopia to be, you know? And so I, I, I kind of think about that and what, what it means to have like a platform in the United States and what it means for my community specifically. So. Yeah, I, I, I agree wholeheartedly. You know, my situation is not nearly as, as perilous or as fraught um, when translating into, into English, but I do run across um, the, the language police would tell me that something is either too American or too Yiddish or too this or too that. Publishers generally, but publishers are very, very uh, ineffective policemen and uh, <laughs> very weak batons that just kind of droop comically. Uh, so you can always- It depends. Win. Yeah, it depends, it depends, it depends. But in my experience, I've been able to, to withstand their, their pressure. And you know, my goal is always to, to plant the flag way beyond uh, what they see as the boundary, to go, to go as, as lead people all the way out there past this magic circle that doesn't actually exist of the standard English or the standard French or the standard any other language. Um, you know, just to demonstrate that that is, that is an illusion. Uh, it's a helpful one. It helps us communicate in everyday life. But when we sit down with a piece of writing or, or sit down to listen to a, uh, to a song that, that changes our, our entire world, we're not thinking about the standard. We're, we're thinking about where it's taking us, the, the destination. Right. Thank you so much for what has been a thrilling and boundary transcending conversation, taking us to unexpected destinations. Um, we're at the end of our hour, uh, so we have to say goodbye, but uh, this has been absolutely fantastic. So thank you so much to all three of you. Yes, yes, thank you all so much. And once again, we'd like to thank our partners, HowlRound, 
Pen America, the Center for the Humanities at the Graduate Center CUNY, the Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library, and the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center. I hope to see you next week. Thank you very much.